let you know we're in the middle of a, or we're starting a new series today that's going to go for the next four weeks called You Are What You Eat. And then I was going to come up and say very slowly, repeat the tagline, You Are What You Eat. This is going to be really cool, but... <laughs> That's not what's happening, but I, I want to do that because I do think we're in a season in life, January, New Year's resolutions. How many of you have made resolutions that have something to do with what you eat? Just show of hands. Yeah, it's this time of year that we tend to reevaluate our relationship with what we eat, what we don't want to eat. And did you know that from the beginning, Christians have made a really big deal about what we eat? So for the next four weeks, we're going to be in a series called You Are What You Eat. And in two weeks, two, like as in two Sundays from now, uh, one of the best theologians in our fellowship, John Mark Hicks, is going to come, and he's going to be doing something for us on both Saturday, uh, January 25th, and Sunday, January 26th. And I highly encourage you to plan out. Next, that Saturday afternoon, he's going to be talking about how to read the Bible, about how um, Churches of Christ historically have viewed assembly, and, and it's both strengths and weaknesses. And then on Sunday, he's going to be talking about communion, and he has written one of the best books I have ever, the best book I've ever read on communion called Come to the Table. And I highly recommend you make sure that you show up for that because in our tribe, one of its great strengths is every week we gather around a table. Now that takes a lot of different forms at a lot of different churches across the world. Sometimes that happens in strip malls and sometimes it happens under mango trees and sometimes it happens uh, in buildings like this. But every week we take a, a small thimble full of grape juice and a piece of cracker or unleavened bread of some kind and we talk about how this is Jesus' body and blood. It is the most important thing that we do. Because think about it, we could gather together and not sing, we could gather together and not have a sermon, but you would think if you left on a Sunday morning and we didn't have communion, we missed church. Because this has been, for the last 2,000 years in, Christ, in Christian history, Christians have said this was central to what it meant to gather together as church. This is what people of Jesus do. Because this is who Jesus is, this is what Jesus does from the start. But it's hard to understand, especially for outsiders. So uh, uh, Dan Kimball is a Christian leader in California. Um, he wrote a book called Adventures in Churchland, but he wasn't always a Christian. And in his book, he talks about how when he was at college, he didn't have any church experience whatsoever. And he and his buddy, when they were juniors in college, went to this Presbyterian church. They didn't know what to expect. And right in the middle of church, they had communion. And they, the way they did communion was they um, passed it around, and uh, they passed around this cup, this one big cup, and the person who passed it to Dan's friend passed it to him and said, this is the body of, or the blood of Christ shed for you. And the guy heard that person say something, but he didn't understand what it was that person had said. He just knew that they had said something. And so he takes a drink of the communion cup just like everybody else was, and now he has to turn and pass it to Dan. But he doesn't remember what that person said. He just remembered that they said something. So he passes the cup to his friend Dan, knowing he has to say something. So he says, here it is, <laughs> the cup of wonder, and gives it to him. <laughs> And I love that on so many levels. One, because that is what we're doing. On, on a lot of levels, when you take communion every week, you're opening your eyes to the wonder that's all around you. But two, because people who are on the outside who don't, aren't used to taking communion, often it is a kind of bizarre thing that we do. So, for example, the atheist neuroscientist, uh, neurosurgeon Sam Harris, who's one of the neo-atheists, he actually said this. Jesus Christ, who as it turns out was born of a virgin, cheated death, and rose bodily in the heavens, can now be eaten in the form of a cracker. So on the outside looking in, it's easy to be skeptical of what we say we're doing. So let me explain. Jesus is telling a story in his life, death, and ministry. And he does it not by giving you some kind of doctrine or idea. He does it by giving us a table, a meal. This is central to what Jesus was doing. So we have been for the last 13 months going through the Gospel of Luke, 
And the next two weeks, we are going to finally finish going through the Gospel of Luke in the middle of this series. But one of the things that happens in the Gospel of Luke, if you can read Luke without getting hungry, you are reading it wrong. For real, Jesus is always either in a meal, coming, going to a meal, leaving a meal. One out of every five sentences in the Gospel of Luke is about Jesus going to, coming from, or eating a meal. That's 20% of the Gospel of Luke. At one point, Jesus even describes his mission as eating and drinking. He says the Son of Man came eating and drinking because Jesus' mission was a meal. Jesus' mission was to give us this meal. In fact, one of the best shorthand descriptions of the Gospel of Luke is Jesus ate good food with bad people, and he does that every week. And each one of these meals meant something. It was like performance art. Jesus is trying to say something about God, about who God is, what God is like by how and who he eats with. Let me explain that. So if you were just to read the Bible through for the first time, one of the things that might shock you is that sin, brokenness, evil, enters the world, not with violence, not with a sexual sin, but with food. The God of Genesis creates the world and, and, and loves what he created. He constantly is saying, this, it is good, it is very good. And then he gives this world to the first human couple, Adam and Eve. He gives them this wide open garden and says, you can eat anything you want except one thing. There's this one tree you cannot eat from. This is the world's first and best buffet, and there's only one dish held back. And God commands them to eat. He wants them to take pleasure, because God is not against pleasure. He didn't have, by the way, he didn't have to make the world so beautiful. He didn't have to make food taste so good. He didn't have to make the world the way he, he did, but he did. Because God is not against eating and drinking and finding pleasure in God's good world that he made. The problem is when you want God, the pleasure, more than you want God. And so in Genesis chapter 3, that's kind of the setup. And in Genesis chapter 3, a serpent comes to Eve and says, uh, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? First off, no, God didn't say anything like that. God commanded them to eat from all the trees in the garden except one. The serpent's trying to make her think God is somehow bad or against them. Go to the next slide, please. The woman said to the serpent, we can eat fruit. We, can, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree in it that's in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, which, by the way, God didn't say that. Eve, from the very beginning, is adding rules that God didn't say, and in it, She's opening herself up to this toxic idea that God is somehow against them. So, God did say, you, you can't touch it or you will die. You will not die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. We're going to come back to this next week. But God, your eyes will be open and you'll know good and evil. And the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and desirable for gaining wisdom. She took some and ate it. She gave it to her husband who was with her and he ate it. And the eyes of both of them were open and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings so that they could uh, be covered. I, I don't see how, uh, that's not part of what we're going to do yet. Um, so she sees it, she's tempted, she, she uh, pays attention to it. The word there is behold, uh, means to put something at the center of your attention, um, and then she eats it. Even though she wanted something that wasn't hers, she takes it. She coveted it. It's like actually the same word God uses in the book of Exodus for thou shalt not covet. That's the word for what she did to the fruit that was on this forbidden tree. They gravitate with, to the forbidden fruit. And the problem with this food is that it made promises it could not keep. And so Eve takes it. She takes what isn't hers. And she becomes the first woman in human history to discover the link between... Indulgent eating and having nothing to wear. <laughs> and their eyes are open. I think it's fascinating. The very first temptation in the Bible involves food. And if you were just reading the Bible for the first time, and you were reading Genesis 3, you wouldn't be surprised when you got to the book of Leviticus, 
And God is creating this new people. And he, one of the things he, he uh, brings up over and over again is what they should eat and what they shouldn't eat. By the way, this is a great reason to believe that there really is a God. Because there's no way if human beings were just creating a religion on their own that any dude would be a part of creating a religion that said there's a rule against eating bacon. But these guys, these people, they decided they were going to hold faithfully to those rules. They did not. They're, they're, one of their boundary markers were, was not just who that was at the table, but what was on the table. And these Jewish people, they lived faithfully like by that. So for example, some of you know the story of Daniel. When the Jewish people are in exile, some of the, uh, the, the Israel's brightest and best are um, being trained up by Babylon, and they're trying to make them big and strong, so they're trying to make them eat food that Jewish people refuse to eat. And Daniel and a few, or a few of the boys that are being you know, trained to be the you know, next generation leaders refuse to eat the meat of Babylon. Because it's against what their religion says. So they say, please, just let us eat vegetables. Let us test God and see if we can just eat vegetables and if we grow big and strong. And they grow big and strong by eating like spinach. They're the pie pies of the Old Testament. Because all throughout the Bible, God commands us to consider what it is we eat, especially when it comes to our relationship with him. And so, for example, in the Gospel of Luke, the, when, before Jesus begins his ministry, before he does anything, um, he is tempted by Satan, and the first temptation involves food. Because sin entered the world through food. Satan tries to get Jesus to turn stones into bread and take, like Adam and Eve, but where Adam and Eve said yes, Jesus says no. But he says more than no. He says, people do not live by bread alone, but by the words of God. Well, what does that mean, Jesus? You can't eat the Bible. What are you saying? It means we're not sustained by food. Not fundamentally. We're sustained by God. This is an orientation of life. One, the, the, what Jesus is saying no to is this idea that i got to watch out for myself. If I'm going to be provided for, it's because I'm going to provide for myself. I'm going to take whatever it is I can get to make sure that I've got what I can get while the getting's good. And the other is a way of looking at life as receiving it. This, by the way, is why Christians say grace before meals. It's not because you're trying to check off some kind of religious requirement. It is to fundamentally change the way you look at the table. Because this is a gift. What you're eating is a gift God has provided for us. Maybe this is why all throughout the Bible, God uses food as one of the deepest ways to remind us of reality. And the greatest example of this is the Passover story. Okay, so for those of you who are new to the Christian faith, or, or maybe you haven't heard this story before, in the book of Exodus, right after the first book of the Bible, the Israelites are enslaved. They're, slaved in, they're slaves in Egypt. And God comes to Pharaoh through Moses and says, let those people go. And Pharaoh doesn't want to give up on his free labor, so he says no. And so God sends nine plagues, because the Pharaoh had nine different uh, pseudo-gods that were working for him, and each one is breaking that god. And Pharaoh still says no. So finally he sends a tenth devastating plague where he wipes out all the firstborn of Egypt. And that sounds awful until you re remember, God is breaking the dynasty of this oppressive Pharaoh. You want to own people? You want people to work for you and, and basically uh, look at them as not human? He's ending that. And that tenth plague did the trick. Everybody, everyone who did not have the blood of a lamb smeared on their doorpost, or everyone who wasn't Jewish, basically, lost their firstborn son. But on the night before Pharaoh let them go, God told all the Jewish people to have a meal. He gave them instructions on how to do this so that they would never forget God saved them from slavery. God brought them out of bondage. And by the time of Jesus, they were still celebrating this Passover meal. In fact, Jewish people to this day still celebrate this Passover meal. It's a big deal. And the way they did it was pretty consistent. So they ate unleavened bread, and they ate unleavened bread because they, uh, on the night they hurried out of Egypt, there wasn't time to add yeast to the dough. 
They wanted to be reminded of that. It was reminded for generations to come. They ate bitter herbs. They ate bitter herbs to remind them of themselves of the bitterness of slavery. They ate fruit paste <clears throat> to remind them very practically of the mortar they used to put between the bricks when they were slaves in Egypt. They drank salt water to remind themselves of the bitter tears that were shed while they were in slavery. During the first Passover, they ate with their cloaks tucked into their belts because they were going to have to hustle out of there. But by the time of Jesus, they didn't eat like that. They, eat, they ate reclined to remind themselves, we ain't in Egypt anymore. We're not slaves. We are free men and women of God. One of the things we miss about the Passover that Jesus celebrated the night before he died is it was not this somber, serious event. If it was like Passover that Jesus would have celebrated every other year of his life, it would have been this moment of celebration because we used to be slaves and we're not anymore. We are free people. This meal wasn't like every other meal. It was a special meal that reminds us of our story. Yeah, it reminds us of the bitterness of slavery, but it also reminds us that God set us free. And it was this wonderful teaching moment, like what even we're doing now. So they would frame the Passover. To this day, the youngest boy or the oldest boy in a family would ask, maybe it's the youngest boy, um, they would ask, why is this night different than every other night? Why only unleavened bread? Why are we dipping in the, you know, they would ask and they would be told the story over and over. And those, that, this meal set the context for them to tell the story of the Exodus to the next generation. But 2,000 years ago, Jesus sits down at a table like this with his disciples and all of a sudden on a Passover, he does something totally unexpected. He takes a cup one of many, which is normal at the Passover meal, as God's people had done for centuries, and then he announces, this will be my last Passover with them. And he says this in Luke 22. We're going to start in verse 17. Uh, actually, 15. 14. When, when the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he said, and he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do in remembrance of of me. Now, if you were there on this night, you would have been blown away. Because this is Passover. Everybody knows this is how pa Passover is not supposed to go like this. Right in the middle of the Passover, Jesus takes a cup and says, not the thing that had been scripted for a thousand years. Jesus says, this is my blood poured out for you. So the disciples would have been like, what is going on? Does Jesus not know how to do Passover? Jesus is reinterpreting in this moment that meal with him at the sitter. When he says, this is my body, it would have turned the world upside down. When he says, this is my blood, that would have been shocked. Because first off, Jews don't drink blood. That's one of their rules. But what Jesus was doing was showing that his life, his ministry, was connected to what God had done in the Exodus story. He's taken the story to the next level. One of the things I love about our tribe is that we made this meal central. We made this meal central to what we do. By the way, in other fellowships, they're starting to do that too. So I don't know if you've heard uh, New Life in Colorado, not the New Life that's, associated, that's uh, in Arkansas, but the New Life that was started by uh, Ted Haggard, who um, had a scandal uh, about a decade ago. He was their senior pastor, and he had a scandal and resigned and, you know, uh, disgrace and all that. Well, one of the things this non-denominational church started thinking about was, you know what? We made a human being too central to what it meant to be a successful good church. And we were too dependent on like celebrity pastor model. So they started thinking, well, how could we fix that? And one of the things that they realized 
was if we took communion every Sunday, then every Sunday, no matter what kind of things were going on around us, every service would be about Jesus. That's what we've been trying to do. And when we forget that's the goal, we lose our Jesus. I mean, often one of the problems in our tribe, and tell me if this doesn't ring true to you, is that we, we know communion is supposed to be at the center of it, but we focused a lot on the how, and, and too often we forgot the why. I mean, in the first communion, it was taken around a table. It, it was taken celebrating Passover. Like, for example, Matthew tells it differently than Luke. So I don't know if you just noticed, but in Luke, Jesus takes the cup first and then the bread. And Matthew, he takes the bread first and then the cup. Why? Because it was Passover. There are four cups of wine in Passover. By the way, that's why the disciples fall asleep in the Garden of Gethsemane next. Four, I kid you not, four cups of wine will do that to you. And with every cup, you know what they would do in the Passover? It was every one of those cups would uh, be reminding them of the promises God made in the book of Exodus. So they'd take the first cup and they would say, God said he would rest, bring us out of slavery to the Egyptians. The second cup, God will bring us out of bondage. The third cup, he will rescue us with an outstretched arm. The fourth cup, I will take you as my people. That's what Jesus was doing. The first communion would have been uh, with them singing the psalms while they took it, the specific psalms. They were, they were talking with each other and fellowshipping with each other while they were doing it. Jesus says right in the middle of this talk, there's all kinds of conversation that's happening while they're doing the very first communion. And Jesus says, I want you to keep doing this regularly. But instead of this being about the Exodus story, I want you to remember me. That's what we're doing in this little series. We're talking about why what we do, what we do every Sunday matters. I never want to get rid of this. I want to make this a bigger deal. But just what do we think we're doing when we come to the table? Every week, no matter how bad my sermon is, and there are going to be some stinkers, Every week, we're remembering the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. But it is possible to do communion right and get it entirely wrong. Just ask the first disciples who were there that night. Look at what happens right after, I mean, at the same table, they're, they're talking, they're doing communion. They don't even know that's what they're doing. And in the very same chapter, verse 24, at the table, a dispute arose among them about who was considered to be the greatest. Can you imagine at the first communion, one of them was like, hey, it was great, Jesus' blood and body and all that stuff. Yeah, I got it. Who do you think's the best out of us? I love that the Bible is just so honest about this. Jesus said to them, he, you know, he hears it. Jesus said to them, you know, the kings of the Gentiles lorded over them, and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you're not like that. You're not supposed to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who's at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. You, have, you are those who have stood by me in my trials, and I confer on you. I give you a kingdom, just as my Father gave me one, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones and judge the 12 tribes of Israel. Here's what I want you to see. Ritually, they're doing everything right because Jesus is the one doing it. He, you know, he rose from the dead. I'd say he got it right. But in the middle of all that... They're fighting over who is the greatest. Do we kind of do that too? So in their book, Friend and Foe, there are these two uh, social psychologists that actually talk about the, how human beings are hardwired for competition. And in it, they cite this study that was done, a scientific study that was done with capuchin monkeys, where they taught monkeys how to trade with currency. They gave them this like... Um, they would give them a, uh, a rock, a stone, 
And they taught them to think of that stone as money, and they would give them a cucumber, a slice of cucumber, if they gave them the stone. And everything was working great for a few months. They did that every day, and then one day they introduced a new dynamic. There were two monkeys, and they gave one a cucumber, and the other a sweet grape. And the monkey who was getting the cucumber went nuts. He got so mad because the other monkey had a grape. He got so mad, he threw the cucumber down and refused to eat. He went and sulked and pouted. And the, the first monkey got both the sweet grape and the cucumber. He, uh, and that they, the, the social psychologist said, just as monkeys care, care about um, compar comparison, so do human beings. It is hardwired into us. Now, it's easy to pick on the disciples for doing this at the table. Hey, which one of us is the greater? But do you not do this too? Do, sometimes we do this even with communion. Well, we got it more right than they did. Well, you look around, oh, you're taking communion. How dare you after the week you've had? What does it look like for you? But this is something that Christians have struggled with from the very beginning. It is easy to pick on monkeys and the first disciples for doing this, but the question is, how do you keep score of your life? Because I bet there are certain things that you're pretty proud of. You've traveled more than other people. You've read more. You're better at speaking, or maybe you're the attractive one in your friend group. You're the smart one. Maybe you're a mom who subtly competes with other moms to have the cleanest or most stylish home. Maybe you're a dad who competes with other dads to, you know, provide, or, or uh, you're a student who competes with other students for grades, or a sibling who's competing for your parents' attention. There is something you are known for, and you like to be known for it. And if something threatens that, you'll do whatever it takes. And if you live that kind of life, this is what Jesus is saying at the first communion, if you live that kind of life, you'll go around terrified that there's always going to be somebody who's got a little bit more of it than you. So this coming Wednesday, this last Wednesday, Davis Burton, uh, who is uh, in our student ministry, uh, high school senior, high school senior, yeah, he's a senior, killed it. He preached and he killed it. It was so amazing. And so this weekend, I was making breakfast with the kids and Eden just goes, you know, Dad, He's our oldest. You could really learn a lot from Davis Burton. <laughs> and if I, if I bought into that mindset of competition, or if I was insecure, that would have crushed me. And she's going to get ungrounded in a few months anyway. <laughs> now, this, this is a way, that's going, a way of, uh, of living in the world that's trying to justify your existence by what you do. And this is why Jesus, at this communion, before he goes to his death, reminds us God has a different scoreboard than we do. He's reminding us this table is not like all other tables. It's a table centered on grace that God gives you the kingdom. You don't take the kingdom. God gives it to you. God remind, Jesus is reminding them, you're called to serve. And you could serve because the kingdom is given to you by grace, not earned by competition. Do you see how big this is? Every day, every Sunday, when you take communion, you're reminding yourself, you didn't earn this. This whole thing is grace. God gives us the kingdom of God as grace. You don't have to compete with others for what is already yours. There is a seat at the table with your name on it, and it's not yours because you're faster or better or smarter or more right than the person to your left or your right. This whole thing is a table of grace. You don't earn this by doing it right. Even the way we talk about communion betrays us. You don't ever take communion. That's what Adam and Eve did. You receive it. This is a gift. You receive Jesus' blood and body. This is a table that's unlike every other table because you come to it empty-handed and you leave full. You know, it took years for the disciples to get this. In fact, it, it, they didn't get it immediately after. So Jesus is raised from the dead, and he's talking to Peter, who's just had the biggest mess up of his life. And Jesus reinstates him. And right after he reinstates him, he tells him, hey, there's going to be a time when you die. And Peter looks over at Jesus and he goes, well, what about John? Because if I'm going to die, I want him to go through that too. And Jesus says, what's that to you, Peter? Come on. Don't you get it yet? But eventually he did. 
Because church tradition says when it came time for Peter to die, before they crucified him, he said, you know what? Turn me upside down. Because God had so stripped him of the need for comparison. He didn't even want his death to be compared to Jesus. He was free from the tyranny of it. You know, we live in a world where people are, there's a legitimate phobia, fear of missing out. One atheist, a guy, a philosopher who I'm going to kill his name, Alain de Botton, he's a French guy. He doesn't believe in God, but he actually has some um, great things to say about this. He says, the reason we have fear of missing out is because when belief in an afterlife is dismissed as childish and scientifically impossible, the pressure to succeed and find fulfillment will inevitably be intensified by the awareness that one has only a single and frightening fleeting opportunity to do so. Once you stop believing in heaven, you're going to fear, be afraid of missing out all the time. In such a context, earthly achievements can no longer be seen as an overture to what might realize someone, might, someone might realize in another world. Rather, they are the sum total of everything you will ever amount to. And that's why this table every week is so important, because look what Jesus has says in Luke 22. If you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Every time we drink this cup, we're not just looking backwards. We're looking forward to when we have this meal with Jesus. And this is how the prophets talked about the age to come. Surprisingly, they didn't just talk about there not being any more death. They didn't just talk about there not being any more suffering and pain. They talked about a meal with God. So look in Isaiah 25, how the prophet actually says this. On this mountain, in the age to come, in God's good future, the Lord will prepare a feast of rich food for all people, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats, and the finest of wines. On this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all people, the sheet that covers all nations. He's talking about death. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove the people's disgrace from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. When we take this meal, we are looking back to the Passover night when God rescued us from slavery. When we take this meal, we are remembering what God did in Jesus Christ on the cross, but not just those things. We are looking forward to when God sets everything right and takes this meal with us again. Because Jesus is the new Passover lamb. He is not just delivering his people from the powers. He is defeating the powers that run this world. It's easy to be cynical. It is easy to look at life and, you know, Iran and World War III and all the things that are uh, threatening us and just be cynical and give in to despair, but not this table. Each week, this table reminds us God has broken into human history. Things aren't going to stay this way. The world will one day not be like this. When we are taking the Lord's Supper, Jesus is reminding us things don't have to stay like this. King Jesus has defeated the powers of this world. He's flipped them on its head. It doesn't have to be this way. When you take communion, you are plugging into a story as old as the Exodus itself. That's what Jesus believed. That's what Jesus is giving us. This is his body broken for you. You don't take this. It is given and you're not in Egypt anymore. It means your addictions, your habits, your sin, they don't have to stay this way. Every week as you receive communion, you're reminded Jesus is king and this is his meal. So welcome to the table. The table you didn't earn, you don't get it because you're right. You are given it because it's his. This is a table of pure grace. Church, you are what you eat, and we are the body of Christ.